there are a lot of just, well, because of X, Y, and Z, this hands a call, and because of A, B, yeah. and C, this hands a bluff. I think I actually asked one of them, like, what's the first thing on your mind when you're, you know, in this in this river spot or whatever? And they were just like, is he bluffing here? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's different from the answer that I got from the higher stakes player. If you take the approach of memorization, you'll you'll. I feel like I've played against some people who just have really good flop C bet ranges. But then they just don't, like, I feel like they don't understand poker. Hey, everybody, Phil here, and uh, this is the Phil Galfon podcast. Uh, today I'm joined by fellow Run It Once coach and high stakes, I guess, fellow high stakes online and live player, Kevin Rabishow. Um, I want to give a uh, disclaimer to everybody watching. So both Kevin and I um, put a lot of time and effort into releasing uh, courses this year. Um, uh, mine was released at the beginning of the year. Kevin's was released, uh, more recently. So this, this might end up feeling a little bit like an infomercial, uh, for our courses because, uh, both of us love teaching poker and, uh, both of us put a lot of time and energy into teaching poker specifically this year, but, but over the, the last, I don't know, decade plus. And so that's what we're going to talk about because we find it really interesting. But, uh, if you don't want to hear us talk about our own products, um, then you don't have to. Uh, and thanks for watching the intro. Um, without further ado, uh, Kevin, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for that, yeah. Phil. Uh, how are you doing? I'm doing well too. Thank you. Thanks for uh, joining me today. So let's start with, um, let's start actually a little bit further back um, with, I don't, I don't want to go through, you know, the whole uh, poker origin story, but let's talk about your coaching origin story. Um, so what's sure. your first experience teaching poker, uh, in, in some form or another? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'd have to think back to how much I would call like certain stuff that I did early in my career coaching. I definitely remember. So like I was, I was a big part of, um, the two plus two community when I was getting started in, uh, learning the game myself, I guess that was like. 2007, 2008, where I was spending a lot of time on there learning. I believe on there, there was also like a coaching, uh, what do you call them? Sub forum or, or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, where you could offer services. And there was really no like barrier. There was no, you didn't need any qualifications. Anyone could just put up a post there. So I think at some point pretty early, I'm, I'm sure you could go back and check this, I guess, if you looked up the activity of bear wire on two plus two. Um, I think I made a listing in like 2009 or 2010 and had a few people um, working with me for, I don't know, $50 an hour, $75 an hour, whatever I felt was reasonable at the time. For, for what, whatever reason, I was, I was pretty keen to, um, to teach someone. And I, if I remember correctly, I was working with like heads up no limit players who were playing the smallest stakes at that time. Uh, and mm -hmm. at, at least one guy in particular, I remember being like uh, quite, giving me quite a lot of pushback. I suppose on my on my coaching, um, and that was that was uh, nice. I think to to get early on in coaching when I was like sort of a nobody, and um, to have a student sort of challenging me and saying like, "Hey, uh, I don't agree with the type of stuff you're saying," and that, that maybe um, helped me realize like, "Oh, maybe I'm not in a position to be teaching quite quite this early in my career." Interesting. Yeah, I think. I mean, as you know, we learn a lot through teaching, um, even if we don't have students who push back, but often, you know, in spots where we're challenged, um, it's a great learning opportunity. So you, you took it as a learning opportunity and did you step back from coaching at all? Yeah. I mean, I, like, it's hard for me to remember the specifics, honestly, because mm -hmm. during that time, I can't say that I worked with any more than like two or three students. Uh, yeah. you know, like maybe I would have maybe some of my friends at, you know, who weren't as serious about poker strategy as I was would say that I was like coaching that or quote unquote coaching them. Right. But we would just, we would talk strategy or whatever. And maybe they would just defer to my opinion on a lot of things. Um, but yeah, I, I guess you would say took a step back. Um, but I was shortly after that making content with, um, with husng.com. Mm -hmm. Although I, I don't know if those those products came out until maybe 2013 or so. So there must have been at least like two years in there where I wasn't really coaching in, in any uh, meaningful way. Yeah, cool. So you were you 
did you start by playing Heads Up No Limit? Was that always? I mean, yeah, it was. It was probably the most like seriously that I took any format. I played a little bit of um, Six Max Cash before that, okay. and a little bit of like very recreationally played Sit and Goes, uh, Forty Five Man Sit and Goes. But okay. I, I would say Heads Up was the first game that I took like quite seriously and and saw myself move through the ranks of. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So then let's get to uh let's get to run at once. Um mm-hmm. so I I actually don't uh remember how uh how and when like did we find you? Did you find us? I don't remember. It's it's funny, I was I was reflecting on this, I guess like a, a couple months ago. I was writing a variety of social media templates to <laughs> to help promote this course. And one of the things that I was think was reflecting on was like the um exactly that just joining run at once how it happened i remember having a friend um he was a heads up player at the time i don't think he plays heads up these days but he he's still a professional poker player uh his name is michael and michael was telling me like hey there's there's no heads up content like on any training sites that i that i like but he was you know someone who wanted to see that and he literally just asked me like would you think about making training content for run at once i was like i mean yeah <laughs> of course i would i I didn't, I don't know if, if this is like, I don't know if this has always been the case. I guess you've, you've been a part of several training sites, um, in your career. Like I, I've never really seen much of an official posting, like we're looking for coaches come apply. Like, yeah. has that ever been part of the training site industry? No, I've never seen, I've never seen it. Yeah. And you know, with, with other training sites, it always seemed to be that for the most part, coaches would come to you. Um, but actually with run at once when we launched, um, my co-founder Dan, like he was doing research, like he was deep in the lab doing research on, on who were, who were the winningest players at, at various games. And we, we actually mm. cold contacted a lot of coaches, some like, and he was like Google stalking them. A couple were like, how did you even <laughs> find me? How did you even know, right. like know how to reach me? Cause they were pretty anonymous. But, um, so yeah, that's why I didn't know. So you found us, but we should have yeah. found you. I'm glad. Uh, so thank you, Michael. <laughs> um, little, I think you. I think I've told you this before, but um, I've watched more Kevin Ravishow videos than any other coach um, because I like them. I've I guess that that part's implied. That. But I, yeah, I've taken that uh, quote and used it for marketing. I, I did appreciate it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, yeah, I've always really enjoyed your content, and um, I think especially especially before I got back, kind of from uh, playing hiatus into playing more seriously and studying um kind of plo solvers before that my approach was so so different than uh you're very kind of calm theoretic i mean i'm calm but <laughs> basically what really appealed to me was um the way that you would teach and kind of just talk through hands and you would obviously make some and st- you, you make some deviations but there are a lot of just well because of x y and z this hands a call and because of a, B, yeah. and C, this hands a bluff. And um, I knew that I needed that kind of in my, in my, in the way that I thought through poker, because that's, that's not how it's, I was thinking through poker at the time. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I, I mean, I guess maybe this is because, as you said, you had a hiatus from like mm-hmm. studying in that way, but maybe because I didn't really take, there was no like gap in, in my learning process. I didn't really think of myself as someone who was very theory oriented until that was like pointed out directly to me because <laughs> i because i don't think that's the way i think when i'm playing so much i mean maybe i don't know i guess someone who's watched more of my live play videos would have like a, a more realistic sense of of my thought process than what i'm imagining but i i find myself mostly making exploitative decisions at least at least in like big spots or like maybe mm-hmm. it's like when it um when it seems appropriate to me but uh, yeah, I, I suppose just by the, by nature of the way that I studied and, and, um, the kind of like defensive mindset that I, that I brought to a lot of, um, my strategy, I think that just comes off as, as very theory oriented. Yeah. I think, yeah, defensive is a, is a good way to put it because you were just, I don't know. I found comfort in, in like how protected your ranges were and, mm-hmm. um, you know, how well you could defend in, in various spots. Cause I, I, at the time, you know, struggled with things like that, like 
oh, this board's really hard for me to defend on, things like that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so so you've been making Run Once content for a long, long time, training videos, um, a lot of live play videos and, and session review videos, which are my kind of my favorite to watch and to make. Um, and uh, you've done some group coaching, uh, mm-hmm. presumably some more one-on-one coaching as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, and now you've released a course. So I guess let's take a, before we get into, I, I want to talk about the courses and the approach to making them, but before, the, before we do that, why, why teach poker? Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. from, from, from an early point in your career, you were teaching poker, as was I. What, what was the appeal to you of, of teaching? I guess that's, that's not much of like a conscious decision that I, that I remember going through, you know, like, I, I don't think there was a point when I was, I don't know, uh, not satisfied with my income. And I was thinking like, Oh, I have to get this side hustle. Or I don't think there was a point where I was like feeling that I had all this great information that I really had to share and, and just like had this urge to get it out. It's just something that I, that I like to do. I, I don't think I have much more of a complicated reason than enjoying it. Um, I've, I've talked with a number of people before about like why I enjoy it. Um, but I I think that's like, first and foremost, it's, it's just, um, I like it. It's engaging. I like it more than playing honestly, which is, I think weird, um, for a lot of people who, who enjoy playing or, or are competitive. Cause I I think I'm quite competitive as well, but, um, I don't know something about it. I, I just like the process more, but I, again, I wouldn't have found that out unless I did it so much. And I don't exactly remember why I started doing it in the first place. It just seemed kind of natural. It just happened. Yeah. I honestly think, so I think the reason that I started doing it in the first place, so I liked talking strategy and back then in the, you know, and back when I was young, uh, two plus two, <laughs> there was, you know, a lot of, uh, strategy discussion. So I, I like taking part in that. And the first thing I did in coaching was uh, write strategy articles for Bluff Magazine. Mm-hmm. And I think, honestly, that came from a place of kind of wanting recognition of my abilities, um, mm-hmm. like came from an ego place. Um, and then once I started sharing strategy, people really liked it. And so it, I mean, I don't know how much is, you know, how much of it, is, is that like feeding into that ego, but also just enjoying, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's really enjoyable to put content out there and see that it helps people. Um, and so I, yeah, I found out that I really liked it too. And yeah, the rest is history. <laughs> when, when you were like, um, when you were early, I guess an early user on two plus two, were you someone who was like regularly explaining to, to other people, like for, for no particular reason, other than just to like share the strategy where you like jumping into threads and like correcting people or were you someone who like wrote your own threads to, or, or was bluff magazine oh, yeah. like the first kind of, you know, strategy writing you were doing? Cause I'm starting yeah, to was, think that two, that two plus two was probably a big fact, like a big influence for me. Yeah, I was, I don't feel like, so I was, I felt like I was mostly talking. I talked a lot of strategy and I, I posted hands for other people to, to comment on, um, but I didn't feel like I was going down and explaining things to people who were playing much smaller than me. I kind of felt like I was talking to peers. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if I was in like, it was, it was the sit and go forum, one of the sit and go forums. I don't know if they had them split by stakes or I was in the high state, but like it yeah. didn't feel like I was going into like micro stakes threads and being, and teaching. It just felt like I was talking with peers about strategy. Yeah. That's how I remember the heads up no limit forum as well, mm-hmm. but perhaps like heads up no limit when I was playing, I think started at 25 cent, 50 cent. I think that was the smallest game that existed. And I was playing probably that or probably, you know, maybe 50 cent a dollar. So I was basically starting at the bottom and talking with a bunch of people who were willing to engage with that stuff. So, um, I guess I had to be speaking to my peers. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And then, yeah, as I, as I moved up, like two plus two discussion wasn't much of a thing anymore. And I, by that point, I'd also made friends with a lot of the people I was formerly speaking with on those, um, on the forum. So we wouldn't really use that as the medium of conversation anymore. What do you think? So some people out there, uh, watching this, uh, want to learn poker, uh, in one way or another, how should they go about deciding whether to watch regular training videos, to buy a course, to, to get a, into a group coaching or, Mm -hmm. uh, one-on-one coaching set? What, what are the different mediums 
what are the big differences to you in, in terms of what you can communicate and how you can communicate, how you can learn? Yeah. Yeah. I've, I thought about this a lot. This was, um, this was sort of the, uh, question that, that motivated the the middle section of, of my course, which is kind of like a, an analysis of all the different study methods and what they're useful for. And, but I've had a few people recently like reach out in private sort of asking, you know, what would like, what level is appropriate for me? You know, what should I be starting with, whether they're new or whether they're maybe a, a small stakes player or whatever. I, I always thought there was, at least when I learned the game, there was this natural progression from like books to videos to tools in, in mm -hmm. some way, I guess, like books were very entry level. They explained like extremely fundamental things like, like math or, or terminology or, uh, the value of aggression or whatever. Um, and then videos seem to be this, this medium that, um, could convey a lot more detail, uh, and just let you listen to someone who was good at the game, like speak about the game in a, in a more advanced way. So I think that that matters a lot. And I think then ideally, like you can, you can pick out from what you're listening to in strategy videos or, or um, training videos, you can pick out methods that those coaches are using to get better and like apply them to yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think like the most advanced form of learning is, is, um, is self-guided. And I guess that, you know, or that could be hiring a private coach or something, but something independent of like a, a product uh, yeah. is kind of where like the, the top level of learning is happening. Um, so I suppose, yeah, like there's a lot of people who try to skip those steps, I think. And I, I don't know if that's viable these days. It's, it's interesting with, you know, with solvers being a lot more accessible than they used to be. It's, um, I'm sure there's a number of very good players who have never read a poker book in their life. So mm -hmm. I, I suppose that yeah. that progression that I'm used to is, is maybe not necessary anymore. Um, but I do think that there's like a progression from free options to, to very affordable options to far more expensive options. That's, that's usually my like number one recommendation to, to players starting out is like, don't blow your bankroll on, on fancy tools, right? Like you, mm. it's pretty important to play, um, and to, and to be able to win without, I don't know, a, a $2,000 piece of software. What would you say to somebody? So let's say there's a, a low stakes heads up, no limit player. He, he can't afford you your hourly coaching. So he mm -hmm. wants to know if he should, uh, watch your run at once, like elite videos, if he should, um, buy your course or if he should hire a, you know, uh, a couple stakes above him coach, uh, for heads up, mm -hmm. no limit at an hourly rate he can afford. Um, obviously you don't know this coach, um, but without, yeah. without knowing the coach, how, how would you, what would you advise him to do? Um, and if you feel uncomfortable answering it about yourself, maybe we could give the example of a, a heads up PLO player and, and me. Yeah. Um, so I guess the way that I think about private coaching in, in comparison to like a more generic product that, that one of us or, you know, any, any coach would put on the market, um, is that the private coaching helps apply concepts that are that are um, possible to explain, uh, you know, cheaper and, and to the masses in like a video or in a course, um, it, it mm -hmm. personalizes them, right? It, 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 it gives the opportunity for the coach to identify in that, in that player, like, oh, okay, this, if you didn't realize this about yourself, these are the things that you're, that you're misinterpreting or you're doing poorly, or like, I, I find I'm usually just, just um, identifying blind spots with my students and pointing them out yeah. and then just saying, well, now that you know, this is what you need to work on. Like, here's how you do that. Um, it's hard to do that with a course. So I guess if I would say if that person's reason for seeking help is that they don't understand concepts, then I think they can accomplish that cheaper by, by subscribing to run it once or by, bu or by buying a course. Um, mm -hmm. I think if they feel that they understand concepts, but they're struggling to win, then I think hiring a coach is is a much better move. Um, assuming yeah, but, that affordability is, is reasonable, right? Yeah. Yeah. By, I guess my disagreement there is that a lot of people 
who would answer yes to that? I, yeah, I think I understand concepts. Um, don't, don't understand the concepts. And so they need the, well, has that been like, yeah, I mean that it, it's possible that what they need is to hire a coach for an hour and find out that they don't actually understand and then, and then go back a step. Um, yeah, cause it, yeah, if the, if they don't know what they don't know, then someone needs to tell them. And if, if, you know, if they don't have a peer who's going to do it, then a coach is, is probably best suited. Most of the, I mean, I, I make, training videos, uh, and run once is training videos. Um, I don't do a lot of one-on-one coaching, basically none. Um, I always, I, I think that one-on-one coaching has the, the most potential for helping somebody improve drastically, but, but it's risky because, well, you have to pick the right coach. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I think, you know, uh, it's easy for a coach to lead you astray and you're putting a lot of trust in a coach. Um, so picking the right coach is really important. And I think sometimes a coach with a, a track record that you trust or recommended by somebody who's, who's really good and, and who you have a lot of confidence in, then, then I think that's very valuable. Um, but I think the nice thing about, you know, a course from you is that you're not going to, you're not going to lead them astray. Um, you're not going to, you know, they're not going to get their personalized, um, feedback on, on their blind spots, but anything they do pick up is going to be, it's going to be right. And I think that's actually, I think it's dangerous to, to learn the wrong way, I guess. Yeah. It's interesting, I guess. Yeah. So my, it, with my answer, I was assuming I was the coach and also the producer of the content. Um, yeah. No, you can't be the coach. I, You're too expensive. <laughs> well, I think, I think that, um, it kind of points at, at something that I find not necessarily problematic, but just like very common in the poker industry is that a lot of the coaches, uh, available are, are very recognizable, good players, uh, which is very, which is normal. Um, but not necessarily people who have given much attention to like how to, how to help their students. They're, they've maybe mostly given attention to like how to be really, really good at this game. And then when you hire that coach, um, they're quite likely to just convey like some percentage of what they know, um, and hope it sticks kind of thing, Mm -hmm. which is, it's, it's almost like just buying a personalized training video, I guess. Like it, it kind of feels yeah. like, okay, well that, that same information it's maybe, yeah, it's kind of nice. I suppose that someone like you mostly makes training videos because you're accomplishing that, but for way more people all at once. So you can just kind of like, as you learn things, you can just share that portion of information to the masses and, and a ton of people get helped that same amount. Um, but then like yeah, there's leverage. Yeah. For for individuals, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of like you said, I guess they need to find the right coach. Um, they need to find a coach who like actually understands um, how to identify what they need. Yeah, but I, I mean I will say I think investing in yourself. If you're serious about poker, um, you're going to be playing for a while. I think you know most investments are going to be good investments. Um, yeah, because it it just I mean it just pays for itself very quickly when you're playing a lot of hands and increasing your win rate by one big blind per hundred or less even, um, and compound that over the many years of moving up in stakes faster and things like that. I have always been a a firm believer in investing in your game, um, one way or another. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, So let's talk about your course, um, which is called the game plan. Um, so your course, I I guess I I won't, uh, describe It's not a heads up, no limit, hold them course per se. It's not a yeah. MTT course. Um, describe what it is and, and then how you decided to, to make a course like this. Yeah. So the, the course, I suppose, fundamentally is, is my attempt to, to package the kind of stuff that I was saying is like the benefit of private coaching mm-hmm. and, and make it wider spread, like make it, make it accessible to a, to a wider audience of people who just generally want to get better at poker and uh, the the reason I ended up going in that direction with the type of course that I was making partially was because I I didn't think I'd be helping that many people by making just a heads up no limit course. So I don't think that making a, a super detailed heads up no limit, um, you know, twenty twenty two course would appeal to that many more than like I don't know thirty or forty people in the world because mm-hmm. um, not that many people are playing heads up no limit and and even fewer of them think that they need to buy a course from me. So I think um, 
what really led me to uh, broadening it was was how much time that I spent doing private coaching in the last couple of years. Uh, when when COVID hit, I I wasn't able to travel as much. Um, I was primarily playing live tournaments. Let's say like the year and a half leading up to to that, and uh, so not only did I get a lot of coaching requests, but I also had a lot of free time to mm-hmm. um, to take on new students. So I took on like a, a lot of students, uh, and I and I worked with a variety of players who I had never really worked with in any serious way previously. So I started to see like the commonalities in their needs, right? I, I started to see that um, almost everyone who was coming to me didn't really understand how to use tools in, in an effective way. I, I realized they didn't really know um, why they were why they were good or what they needed to work on. Like maybe they had a, a rough idea, but it was all very vague. Mm-hmm. And I found myself just kind of repeating the same process with all of them over the first couple of, of hours of coaching. Um, if they're an online player, it was like, let's analyze your database. Let's mm-hmm. pick out the three things that you need to work on that are most urgent. And then let's come up with a few, you know, easy ways to do it. Uh, that was like every single new client that I took on was going through those steps. So I was like, <laughs> when, when we started talking about doing a course, I was like, well, this is, this is very broadly applicable, right? This could help a lot of um, people who are playing a lot of different games and maybe just never thought to, to come to me for coaching. So now they, now they get to see that process. Yeah. I mean, that's your responsible coach because you're in doing that. You're, I, I don't mean the course, but even in the, in the, in the private coaching, you're, you're leveraging the time that they are paying you for, uh, rather than just saying, well, come to me and I'll explain these concepts to you, um, <laughs> you know, one hour at a time, uh, yeah. you're, 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 yeah, setting them in the right direction, which is what a, what a good coach should do. Um, so, so what was the process like in creating the course? Um, you built the outline cause I, I just, I, so the course, I, I mean, I've been making training videos forever. Um, but this was the first course I ever made. Um, and it mm-hmm. was, it was daunting to, yeah, to kind of map it out and, and finally do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm curious to hear about that, but I'll, I'll tell you my, yeah. my outline process, I guess a little bit. So the, like once, once I recognized the angle that I wanted to take with the course one, you know, the, the way that I just described kind of being that, that startup um, path for a lot of students of mine, uh, the outline came together really fast for the first couple sections. So it came together really fast for, um, evaluation and for improving. And, and also just the, the very, I think the first couple, the first videos I recorded are actually the first two videos of the course, which is just in theory and in practice. That was like, uh, those were a couple of, um, seminars actually that I put together during one of those earlier group coaching projects, just kind of reworked them to, um, be appropriate for the course, but the, the concept that, that, uh, drives the whole thing, this idea that people need to like take their theory study seriously. And also their, their like practical execution, um, seriously was, uh, like, I knew that that was, that was going to be the direction of the course. So, so everything that followed that part of the structure came together really, really fast. And then I got to the game plan section, which was the heads up, no limit, section and and I just kept kind of um restructuring and and redoing it and uh I think I was fighting the urge to just make a whole heads up no limit course um once I got there because I knew that's not what I wanted to do so I kept having to like which has been like a, a really um I think important learning experience for me as a coach over time is like I kept having to strip information away uh, yeah. from, from the end product, which I think helps the course. It might not, it, it might not be, um, as marketable as like, you know, 200 hours of content or whatever. But, uh, in, in the end, I think it, like, it's a product that I'm happier about, but it was hard for me to go like to decide what to focus on. It was hard for me to decide, okay, how do I present, um, the, a full game, like the process of learning a full game and, and executing, a strategy for it without actually doing that, like without, without going through one note at a time, every note in the game tree. Uh, and I ended up somewhere in the middle, I think, like I I still went through quite a lot of parts of the game tree, but, um, I, I held, (laughs) I held back as much as I could. Um, so that part was, was the biggest challenge for me. 
Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't hold back from that. I, I mean, I think <laughs> that I, with my course, I mean, I went through every reasonable note of the game tree on every board texture. Um, yeah. And I <clears throat> ended up with a whole lot of videos. And I think I'm unsure how I feel about it. I, I felt a lot of pressure. I was putting a lot of pressure on myself um, because the, I, I felt like the expectation is if I'm going to make a PLO course, it better be really good. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I just didn't want to leave anything out. Um, but I think part of the, and I mean, people are liking the course, um, people are buying the course, but I think like one thing, so one thing, like you said, it's, it's good for people. If you can distill it to things that they need to learn the most. Um, so that's not taking as much of their time. Um, and also I think that it's, it's not clear to me, uh, how marketable the, I don't, I think my course is like 80 hours or something. I don't know. I don't know how marketable that is because on the one hand, it's like, yes, you're buying a lot of content and you're going to have it forever. But on the other hand, it's like, you're going to have to put in a lot of work to get all, all of the, the value out of this. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes people want to know, you know, Hey, I'm going to study this for 10 hours and I'm going to get better. Um, whereas it, yeah, it can feel daunting. So I don't know what was the right way to go about it. I went about it the mm. opposite way, the, the really, really long way. I mean, I don't um, know that there is like a right way to do it. Right. The, um, I think like you said, there's like the, the expectation that, that your PLO course is, you know, is comprehensive, is, is complete, is, is maybe, it's maybe accurate. I, I mean, a lot of people, which is, which is interesting to me, but I think objectively true. A lot of people watch training content or courses with, with no real intention of getting better as a, as a direct result of having watched it. Like, I, I think there's, there's quite a lot of people who enjoy, um, content like yours just because they enjoy it. Like not necessarily because they think it's going to make them like the best PLO player in the world. Um, maybe they have their own, yeah. you know, reasons kind of tied up in there, but, um, perhaps for that, part of the audience that's that's absolutely the right choice right to make it like very complete very comprehensive um you don't want to leave any plot holes right in your in your movie yeah yeah um one other thing i did that is is different than yours uh is that the, basically i i mean i put a obviously a ton of time into the course um completed it and then that's it um so i don't have a uh, any kind of private groups or, um, mm, yeah. follow up calls or anything like that. Yeah. Um, because I committed, I was comfortable committing to all the time it took to, to put into the course, but, um, I, yeah, the, the long term, I didn't want to bite off more than I can chew or make a promise that I couldn't keep because sure. I end up very busy. So, uh, sure. so you get the course and that's it. Um, <laughs> with your course, um, I know you get access to, a private study discord group. Mm. Um, what else do you get? Uh, there's also four live seminars that we're going to start running like right after the sale ends. Um, so there's going to be like, I, I, I think the way it's going to work is basically those seminars will be recorded as they happen. And then the, the videos will later get uploaded to the course. So it's, it's not mm -hmm. like someone who buys the course later would, would just be blind to that content. But, um, you know, adding, adding a little benefit, allowing people who, who purchased the course early and have already gotten started, um, to get, yeah. to like interact with, with me and the other users right away, I think is, is nice. Um, and they're actually kind of the, so the seminars are not even completely done. Uh, this was part of this was me buying a little extra time to, to finish some, <laughs> some yeah. other stuff. Uh, so I was like, Oh, great. We could just do it live. That's perfect. Um, but what's, what's cool is that you know, we're only, I guess, a, at, at this point, a week into um, launch, and there's already some people in the Discord who have watched through almost everything, and they're giving some feedback on like what's kind of missing, or or what they would, what they're left wanting to know, having already kind of gotten through a lot of the content. So it's like it'd be great if we could cover this in the seminar. And it's like, well, good news, we can, because I haven't made yeah. them yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's perfect. That's one. That is one thing. So, like I said, I. I like a discord that I, that I'd have to keep up with for, you know, indefinitely, uh, was too daunting to me, but I do kind of wish that I had a forum to like a place to talk to 
people who have bought the course and watched a lot of it um, because mm -hmm. I do want to hear what, what's been the most helpful, what, what they feel is missing. And I, I, I know we sent out a, like a survey to, to ask some questions like that, but it's not the same as being in the Discord. So it's really cool that they're in there and you can get that feedback right away. Um, yeah. Cool for them too. Yeah. 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 I think it's like, I mean, I, I don't know if you feel this kind of, you know, when you, when you make training videos, there's kind of that extra layer, I suppose, between you and the, and the student, so to speak. But, um, I certainly find, like, I, th I think one of the reasons I enjoy coaching the most is, is kind of the, not only the follow-up that helps you maybe like tweak your methods or, or get better at like mm -hmm. the game of coaching, but also, um, just knowing that it might've had a tangible impact in some way, like being able yeah. to talk to that person a year or two years later and find out how it, how it influenced them, how your content or your coaching or whatever influenced them is, is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I love that part hearing, um, uh, there's kind of a nice, um, <laughs> there's a fortunate, uh, uh, survivorship bias <laughs> for us where, <laughs> you know, like people who have watched our videos and then stop playing poker, we don't really hear from, but people who have, <laughs> you know, a lot of success and, and then we end up at yep. the same table with are like, Hey, I, I started by watching your videos and it feels, it yep. feels great. You don't get that many people like sitting next to you at world series saying like, Hey, you're the guy who killed poker. Like you're, the, yeah. <laughs> you're that, you're that jerk who made everyone better. <laughs> there, I mean, you get it some, uh, I guess I don't get it a lot in person but I, I get that on twitter sometimes you know why are you why are you teaching yeah. everybody to play better why are you making the games tougher um do you get some of that yeah a little bit yeah yeah and what is your well what is your response to them and what is your thought about it in general um i mean i, I suppose I, I don't know that i've had to like directly respond to any Mm -hmm. Um, you know, any claims of, of that nature. Although I've, I've talked to people who share that mindset. Like I have friends who, who certainly share that mindset that like, mm -hmm. um, you know, information there's, there's no value in sharing information or, or whatever. Um, part of me just like, doesn't care, but I, like, I understand, but at the same time, like from, from my point of view, it's just, it's just not something that, um, uh, I guess like frightens me is, is a better way to put it. Like I, I, I see those kinds of comments as like sort of, um, uh, fear that, that what they have is, is kind of slipping away over time. Right. Um, yeah. this like advantage that they have, they don't, they, they see it as, as finite and that it's like disappearing over time. And, and this is a contributing factor or whatever. And that, that might be true. Um, but that just doesn't, that doesn't, I guess, as a player, that that's not something that frightens me. Um, I, I actually talked to, oh, I'm forgetting who it was at this point. I don't, I don't want to say the wrong name, but, but someone, um, someone else in the coaching industry, we kind of share this opinion that like the, the value, the other way of looking at it is that there's value in making the games tougher. Uh, like the other way of thinking about from an, from an industry perspective, like pushing, um, pushing information that helps people uh, kind of uptake the game and, and feel like they're improving towards a competitive state is the reason a lot of people get involved in the first place, right? Like a, a lot of people wouldn't stick around yeah. in the game. Um, a lot of very good players who are, who are now maybe famous <laughs> in the, in the poker industry, like wouldn't be in this game if it wasn't for training content um, because they would have probably just gone to some other competitive venture that, that offered a, a learning path of some kind. Um, so I think poker would look very different without training content. I'm not, I'm not sure that it would be a version of poker that I would be so excited about. Yeah. Yeah. I feel the same way. I mean, I, I think like if, if somebody, for somebody to take away your edge, like if your edge is getting diminished, it means somebody else's is increasing. Um, now there's the, the, there's the one scenario where just everybody gets so good that it all just goes to rake. Um, but I, I, right. I don't think that's very practical. And I think, you know, if the person who's watching a lot of content, consuming a lot of content and getting better gains an edge and takes away from somebody who was not doing that, but, but had a lead for some reason, I don't, I mean, I don't see why the, the person who had the lead was more deserving right. than the one who's worked for it and, and consumed content. And, and I share your opinion and, and the opinion of whoever you talk to, uh, that, uh, you know, like, I, I think that poker education grows the game. 
Um, it just, I think it just has to. Uh, and yeah. it's, I guess it's easy. It's also for, I'm making an assumption, but I think for people like us who are competitive and who like improving and learn, like, it's very intuitive to think, yeah, of course. Like, I mean, when I, my interest in the game, like I started with books and then I went to two plus two and I learned. And if, and if there was nowhere to learn, I was just gambling. Like it wouldn't have appealed to me. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I think that, yeah, it, it's easy for, uh, not everybody's built the way we are, that that some people do just want to gamble or some people, I don't know, want to try to figure it out on their own, I guess. But I think most people... Mm -hmm enjoy having something to, to work towards and to see progress, to see themselves growing as a player. Like that's, that's the fun or part of mm -hmm. the fun of the game. Yeah. So in addition to courses, uh, we're training content in general, that all the types of content people consume. Um, you mentioned of course, tools and there are a lot more tools than there used to be, but there, there have been tools of some kind for, for a very long time. Can you describe either your, favorite method of study or your go-to in kind of explaining when you're coaching somebody individually, where you, where you point them? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, this is, this has changed, I guess, more recently. Um, as I started working with like a wider variety of players who didn't necessarily have like, um, like advanced understanding of theoretical concepts or, or, you know, maybe they're good players, but they, there's not, um, they haven't gone through the same process that I did, which was like buying PO Solver in 2015 and like keeping up with all of the programs until now. Someone who's in that position, I think, um, gets gets the most, uh, I don't know if, I mean, it might not be like the most cost effective. I don't know if bang for your buck is the right word, but like they, they get really um, immediate impact, I think, from from using GTO trainers. And I would say that that's like, the most impressive modern tool in, in terms of how effective it's been for, for me or for my students. Uh, I know that's like kind of a broad category of products yeah. at this point. There's, there's there quite a, a number lot of, of them, different yeah. GTO trainers, but just like the, the, the fact that we have um, a standard of play to, to challenge ourselves against and to actually be able to like interact with that tool has uh, offered, I think like uh, a really, really big, um, advancement in, in how effective tools can be. Um, that said, they still, they still have the challenge of the user being able to understand what they're doing. Um, mm -hmm. which I think is, well, there's <laughs> maybe not a quick fix, um, for that, but it, it is say, something. When you say understand what they're doing, do you mean understand what the tool is trying to tell them or understand how to go through the tool or understand how to extract the right things from the tool? Um, I guess I was, I was thinking, understand what the tool is, is trying to tell them. Um, although I think both things that you just said are, are happening. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people use the tools sort of aimlessly, uh, which is something that I, I try to address with my students and, and, and in the course as well, kind of focus someone's attention on like, what are we trying to get out of this, this, uh, method of study exactly. Um, but I would say like if someone was just, it, if their only goal was to get better and they said, I can only use one tool, um, which one should I pick? And like, you know, I'll, I'll use it 10 hours a week. And I would just say like, yeah, get a, get a trainer, find whatever format it is that you're playing and just play against it for 10 hours a week and don't do anything else. Uh, they would probably get better really quickly. But yeah, understanding like what the machine is telling them is, is hard. Uh, yeah. And I think for the most part, the conclusions people draw are, I don't want to say incorrect because like the solver can't speak to me. So I don't, I don't know that all of my conclusions are correct either. Right. I've actually did. I've seen a, a lot of your, I guess a lot of your recent content has turned in this direction of, of trying to like use solvers, but not pretend that they're like our, you know, our overlords who, who know everything and should be followed yeah. <laughs> without question. Um, so I guess I'm curious what's what's on your mind in, in that regard. But like the 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 biggest, um, e even though I think it's a big problem that they don't understand, I also don't know if like anyone in particular is is using that same tool. Like you know, very very good players. I don't think anyone in particular is using that same tool and like having this magical understanding 
and therefore being that much far that yeah that much further ahead of the other person who's just using it and doesn't really understand why um, yeah. they're doing what they're doing i think i feel so i think some people will go in and just in addition to drilling they'll you know look at a range in different spots and i think the i think the problem that some people have is they're looking to just like roughly memorize a strategy um mm-hmm. which you just can't they're just too big like i i mean everybody watching if you spent if you spent two weeks trying to memorize um you know a cbat strategy on flop from cutoff first big blind on king seven five two tone <laughs> like i i think you could probably get pretty close um but then when you get to every turn uh, of which there are very you know there are many there are i guess 49 um, and then every river following and all the sequences of action that can take place, you just can't memorize it all. And if you take the approach of memorization, you'll, you'll, I feel like I've played against some people who just have really good flop C bet ranges, but then they just don't like, I feel like they don't understand poker. Um, <laughs> because, and so I, I yeah. think what you need to, what you need to get out of it is you're looking for patterns. So. I would say two things. I think the key actually, so you're looking for the the secondary thing, which I already started saying is you're looking for patterns, which are like, you know, these are kind of the hand qualities that like to be more aggressive, or these are the, yeah. the you know, these are the types of boards that you want to use these sizings on. So you want to look for patterns and, and, but, but I think then it's really about trying to apply human logic as best you can. Um, I know like that's kind of what you're saying is the solver can't speak to you and tell you exactly what to mm-hmm. take away from it. And not everybody's going to, going to take the same thing away from it, but that really is, I think the goal is, is figuring out why it's doing what it's doing to the best of your abilities, because then you can extrapolate. Um, and then you can, you know, in other spots that you haven't studied or you don't mem- uh, you haven't memorized the exact strategy, you can use your feeble human mind and, uh, and get to a conclusion that is at least okay. And I think one thing that that people also tend to not understand is that, you know, there are a lot of, like if, if you plug, a, whatever, if you're looking at a, an individual spot and you give the solver several sizings, it's going to mix a lot. It's going to use a lot of different sizings. And that means that, that those decisions are similar in EV. Um, and there are some spots that uh, I don't want to speak to no limit because I'm not an expert, but there are some spots in PLO where like a turn strategy of only using a third pot sizing and the strategy of only using a pot sizing are actually similar in EV. Um, and you have to, the, the ranges are different obviously because you're trying to accomplish mm-hmm. something different with a third pot sizing and, and with a pot sizing. Um, but a lot of people look at, we'll, we'll see somebody play a strategy that's different than what looks different than optimal and assume that they're making a big mistake. Um, when in actuality, the EVs are pretty similar. And I always look to try to understand what a solver is doing and then try to simplify the solver strategy to accomplish that in a way that I know I can execute decently. And sometimes that is, um, you know, instead of betting like third pot and half pot and three quarters and then checking 20% of the time, it's just betting third pot hundred percent of the time. And then sometimes yeah. it's instead of mixing, you know, third pot and pot, um, and, and, you know, checking half the time, third potting 30%, potting 20% is just potting 30% because I find the pots more intuitive to figure out than, and, and mm-hmm. then like, if you're trying to mix all of the, if you're trying to mix, you're bound to, to do something like you're bound to either weaken one range, you're bound to weaken a range too much. And if an astute opponent fig- uh, figures that out, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So I mm-hmm. always look to simplify, but you can't simplify if you don't understand kind of the goals of, you know, what the solver is trying to accomplish. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think my approach is quite similar in no limit. And what, what comes to mind is that I, I worry that we, um, like the two of us because of how much time we would have spent learning the game before needing to work with solvers. We have this kind of like background structure 
that that mm-hmm. solver um, knowledge can can slot its way into in some way. Um, and and a lot of players, especially players who have started within the last like five years or whatever, don't have any other structure to to fall back on in their game other than what they've learned through solvers or or from other coaches perhaps, um, like through through training videos. And a lot of those training videos use solvers, so. The, the the way that they understand the whole game, I think, is is predicated on like computer outputs, yeah. um, which is really interesting. Like, I, that's something I've I found more um, when I started doing private coaching. Like, in particular, I'm thinking of of the challenge uh, when I was when I was working with Landon Tice, um, playing heads up against Bill Perkins. That mm-hmm. like there was there was this very unique challenge of like him understanding the value of simplification, understanding the value of, of all the things that you're talking about, but also like not really having another framework for poker other than solutions, which, which was, uh, um, yeah, it was really interesting. I, I am curious. I mean, this is something I, I have an opinion on this, but I guess like, um, I'm curious how successful you've, you've found, um, you're able to convey like, like kind of older school ideas, right? Like, like more exploitative Mm -hmm. structures or like more, um, yeah, just like conveying strategy completely absent of, of equilibrium. Right. Um, Yeah. yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I think that I explain it very well, but I don't have one-on-one students and my, and like, (laughs) I I don't have a lot of feedback. So, (laughs) so I, I don't really know. I, I think that, I'm able to simplify it and explain it reasonably well, but yeah, I don't know. Um, it's definitely possible that, you know, I'm, that I'm unaware that I'm talking to a generation of people who are very focused on the, you know, the outputs and haven't thought through, I, I'm hoping that, I don't know. I believe I can. Well, I suspect, I, I, can break through. I mean, I might be wrong, but I, I suspect that whoever's learning from your content is, is absorbing that kind of, framework maybe it's not like something you're intentionally putting forward right but they're they're almost certainly absorbing that that way of thinking um yeah it's it it, it's something that i've tried i guess more deliberately to to put across to students but i have a hard time doing it um because i don't i don't think i don't think i recognize i guess similar to what you just described i don't know that i recognize in my own game like what the cornerstones are of of uh a strategy that doesn't talk about it in that way, like doesn't talk about, you know, balance range construction, doesn't talk about, um, counter exploits or whatever, and just thinks about like, oh yeah, you, you know, these things are not important in that solver output because, you know, the, I think the because is, is something more natural. Um, Hmm. I mean, I still feel though, so I had, like you mentioned, you didn't have the hiatus, but I, I feel like, you know, I was pre, I was a pre-solver player took a break. Now everybody's a solver player. And then I learned to be a solver player. And I do feel like I was starting over in a lot of ways. Um, and it felt like there were kind of two, it's like there were two, I don't know how to put this, but like two tracks, there's my regular thought process. And then there's theory and understanding theory. And until I, Basically, I was kind of a mess until I understood theory well enough that I could combine them because for a while I couldn't I couldn't really combine them because I didn't have a firm enough grasp of the theory. And so in so many spots, I'm left using all of my mental bandwidth, guessing what solver strategy generally looks like, um, right. that I don't have any left. And I'm like, and, and when you're guessing, when you're just guessing, yeah, then you can't, you can't then go to the the human thought process from there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I it definitely like, I felt like I was starting over until it clicked. And then I felt like all of my past experience helped. Right. Like, like, would you have, I guess, like fast forward to, I don't know, one of the Galfon challenges with that same sort of like problem in your thought process have been persisting or were you just kind of like over it by that point? No, it was definitely like, I think the first while of the Venividi challenge I was just trying to guess what the solver would do. And also not Mm -hmm. just with it. So like I had a simplified solver strategy and I was reviewing his stats and I had some like stat exploits in mind. 
Mm-hmm. So like, and I could do that, but I wasn't hand reading. <laughs> um, I really felt like I wasn't hand reading because I couldn't, yeah. I just didn't have the, the mental capacity, the bandwidth, um, to hand yeah. read. Well, it, it's partially because I was so focused on guessing what, what my default game plan should be, but also because without that understanding of, without full understanding of solver strategy, I don't really, you can't really hand read because you don't really know what they're representing. So like, you don't know mm. what their default strategy might look like. Right. You needed to, yeah, this is something I, I find myself anytime like a new tool comes out or a new like strategic, I don't know, maybe it, not every course, but like a lot of new products come out. I'm always like, oh, I need to expose myself to this because I need to know how my opponents are going to be thinking yeah. about the game like six months from now or a year from now. And if they're all going to be getting their <laughs> their knowledge base from this course, then I really need to figure out what's in it. Yeah. Um, it sounds like, like kind of the same thing, right? I've definitely, and then I've struggled sometimes with like hand reading against opponents in that challenge and in future challenges where I'm, uh, I don't know, what, whatever, whatever the action, they small bet river and I'm, and I'm, I'm reading into their sizing because I, I think that they're splitting small and big when in mm-hmm. actuality it's a spot, they only have a small sizing because of, you mm-hmm. know, because of the board texture. And I think there were a lot of times like that where, I mean, I think, I just think that's the perfect example of you can't really hand read if your assumptions about their sizing scheme are wrong because then you're, right. yeah, you're removing hands from their range that you think are going to be in their big bet range. They don't have a big bet range. So, so more re- like I've, I've thought about this a lot recently, like, like, um, kind of like a, a hierarchy of thought process, I guess, if you will, like you know, what, what I want to start with and then how I want to, um, progress through and, what I, what I recommend, I guess this is to myself, it's not to every student, but to my, to myself, what I try to do lately is, is I start with hand reading. So like, you know, exploitative, um, information is the, is the first thing. Um, and, and only once I get to the point in, in the process where I'm like, oh, I, I, there's nothing I can pick up on this. Um, only like, you know, maybe that's step four or something is when Mm -hmm. I revert to my more kind of theoretical mind. And I'm thinking, okay, this is like, there's not much I can do with, let's just defend well against a 33% bet. I think that I sometimes lean, I mean, I guess you're saying it's the fourth step and say, so, yeah, it's the fourth step for me too, probably. <laughs> um, it's, it's pretty far back there, but uh, it is, um, I guess some of the things that, in, that, that are involved in hand reading, we understood before solvers. And so we can still kind of use that logic. So for example, whatever, if somebody check calls on ace, king, deuce, rainbow, and turn is a jack and check, check, and then they bet river, you're like, wait, let's say it's six max. But basically, like, we know that somebody, in order to bluff, they need to bluff with a pretty good made hand. And mm-hmm. some people don't do that. So, like, we get that. But there are a lot of spots like that where you can find that out through studying solvers and just look at what the solver's bluffing and then ask yourself, okay, as a human going to find that bluff and that bluff and is a human going to find this whatever whatever it may be value bet or check mm-hmm. raise or, or whatever the case may be and i think we have the shortcut of having learned before solvers but you can learn all of that through solvers um mm-hmm. and i i mean i try to learn all that through solvers and yeah let's get a spot that's to a figure good out somebody's, somebody's under bluffing or over bluffing based on how hard it is to to bluff properly in that spot yeah yeah that's really valuable i I actually think it's extremely important to draw those conclusions from solvers um, because a lot of people I think don't realize like what assumptions that they're building in to, to a statement like, Oh, they, it's going to be hard for them to bluff this river. Cause I think what they're really saying is like, it's hard for me to bluff this river. Yeah. Like the way that I play, <laughs> but they don't really know what that other person's doing. Like they don't know their strategy. Like maybe they float the flop a lot lighter than, than they would yep. then you know, they themselves would. So, um, so actually like those are, that's, that's always what I'm looking for in a solve, but I, I try not to jump to that conclusion until I've, until I've studied the, um, the output. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I think so much of, I think players that are at lower stakes or just like fans of poker when they, who are like enthusiasts. So they know about solvers, they understand, um, all this and they watch, training videos where people are, you know, talking about all the theory. Um, 
they just assume that humans are getting a lot closer to to solver mm -hmm. strategy than humans are. Humans are not very. It's too hard. It's just really hard to be close. And there are a lot of spots yeah. where humans are messing up. Like most spots, yeah. humans are messing up in one way or another. And if you can figure out which way they're messing up, um, that's where you find some of your edge. Yeah. Some something actually. Um, to to kind of the previous point about. Um, thinking first about exploitative ideas and then and then sort of moving towards theory i i found out when i was doing that group coaching program so the first group that i worked with was like a higher stakes group they they played maybe on average like two five online mm -hmm. um generally very theory-minded players generally very uh advanced in the on the technical side um and they were at that stage where they kind of what you described where they'd just like forgotten to hand read or like they weren't really paying attention to the more obvious, um, not obvious, but like the more in your face type of information at the, at the table that really shouldn't be ignored. Um, yeah. so with them, I was giving that advice. I was like, Oh, you need to, you need to start with your exploits and work backwards from there. Um, then the next session that I did was with a bunch of like, uh, like 100 NL and 200 NL grinders. And I, and I just kind of assumed like, okay, this is like, I learned that this is what people need. So like, this is the framework that you need. And then they were all like, we don't, we don't know what the solution is in that spot there. <laughs> they were all like, like, I can't, I think I actually asked one of them, like, what's the first thing on your mind when you're, you know, in this, in this river spot or whatever. And they were just like, is he bluffing here? <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's different from the answer that I got from the higher stakes player. Like their answer was like, well, you know, I, I think that with these blockers, I'm in like the top third of my range and, you know, I'm only allowed to fold 40% to the sizing. So I, I just have a mandatory call and that's <laughs> like completely different process, I guess, um, yeah. depending on where they're at. So that's interesting. So another time that I find myself, another time that in the past I've found myself struggling, it's kind of similar to the two tracks thing where I haven't, don't have the theory part locked in. It's when I play against somebody who I think has a better understanding than I do. Um, or I play against right. somebody who I think is better than me because I could, I tend to not want to make guesses because I just assume like I've, I've, I've made some, like in my career, I've definitely made some bad folds or bad call downs because I'm just like, they, more often bad call downs where I'm like, he's, he's too good. I have to like, mm -hmm. I have to give him credit for bluffing enough here. Um, yeah. and I refuse to make like a hand read. Um, but yeah, even the best in the world, um, <laughs> even if they have a better theoretical understanding than you, they still are going to mess up spots and usually in kind of the same way, not as, as the general population, just, just less frequently. Yeah. It just reminds me of of taking on like a like a challenging matchup on on the field or whatever in like another you know not in poker but like in a in a sport or something. If you just like look across from you and and think, oh, this this guy's better than me, then you there's just no chance. Like you have you're going to get beat on every single. I don't know what sport I'm going with here. Not <laughs> every yeah, yeah. every play, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. and it's the same in in poker for sure. I mean, I guess we're we're both heads up players so we we kind of have that more direct experience with like you know if if you if you think the person you're matched up with is better than you you're just going to lose to them um yeah but it's it's certainly true in like in tournaments or or any multi-handed format where when you just like um you sit down with you know uh the best turn you sit down with linus loliger or whatever and you just assume like oh he's gonna He's, He's going to know. know every spot. I, I can't possibly do anything. And then, and then we take on this really defensive mindset or we're like, Oh, it, where, where you're on your heels thinking that you just need to like try to play perfect everywhere. And it's, yep. it's not, yeah. That's when you realize how far from perfect, I guess we, we are as players. Cause yeah, you really need to be on the offensive, right? Like you really need to try and attack, um, yeah especially to give yourself a chance. Um, if you're, if there's a significant skill gap, if we're talking about like a recreational player against one of the best in the world, like usually my advice in those situations is to just like be on the attack, right? Like try to, um, yeah, just try to do what you think you're good at and don't yeah. hold back. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that for sure. Um, one of the things I taught in my course or kind of, I don't even know if I taught this, but kind of preached and, and taught the, the, the method that I taught was, I think it's really important to get the, basically a lot of the things that we take for granted, 
that uh, you made me think of this when you're talking to some of your students. A lot of things that we take for granted, um, those have to become automatic, like knowing your sizings in 95% of spots mm -hmm. and, um, you know, knowing like a, a rough simplified solver strategy. And so I, I think that my approach in, in my course was getting people to that point where they had a default game plan that they could execute reasonably well, that was maybe mm -hmm. simplified. Um, but then they could use their brain, uh, from there. They yeah. had, you know, the mental bandwidth. And I guess it was, it was a direct result of my experience and trying to learn theory and, uh, play challenges. Cause that's what I found myself struggling with until I had my game plan down. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's very much, that's very much the idea that I was, I was hoping to, to get across with, um, with the game plan <laughs> was, yeah. uh, yeah, like the, I think the act of, I don't know if it comes across, but like, I, I wasn't so concerned when I was making, um, the last part of the course, when I was making like the game plan part of the course, I wasn't that concerned if the structure of like how the game plan was laid out was, was all that good. Like it, it didn't have to be the perfect, um, methodology for, for simplifying solver strategies mm -hmm. and like presenting information. It, I think just the very concept of like writing down what you're trying to accomplish at the table is, is very foreign to the average player. I'd yeah. say like, and I'm even thinking of professional players. I'm thinking like, not, like certainly 90 plus percent of professional players have like no written record of, of what it is they're doing at the table. Um, yeah. I'm sure there's, there's players who know it better than others. Like if you ask them, you know, what's your, what's your strategy in three bet pots on ace high boards, they could give you like a, a pretty reasonable answer. Um, but if, if I'm being honest, one of, one of the things I found when solvers were really taking off that I, that I love to use as an exploit against my opponents was like, um, was like bet sizing tells almost made like a re a resurgence when solvers mm -hmm. came out and started to be used. Um, like bet sizing tells, I feel like in, you know, 15 years ago were a thing even among good players. Cause like everyone was just winging it. So you would reveal the strength of your hand by accident because you just, yeah just pick random bet sizes. Yeah. And then over time we like consolidated our strategy to like only use one size in all the different spots. So it was more concealed. Like it was harder to tell what part of your range you had. Yeah. And then solvers introduced the idea of using multiple bet sizes in the same spot. And all of a sudden, like everyone broke off again and just started revealing the strength of their hand in every spot because yeah. they, because they couldn't keep track. Like they couldn't, they couldn't keep track of what it is they were trying to do. So they would just get a spot. They'd have third pair on the river and they'd be like, yeah, this seems good enough to block. And, yeah. and they would only block when they, when they went through that process, right? When they, when they had third pair and they, and they looked at the board and they thought, oh, this spot makes sense to block. But in reality, they're just blocking because they have third pair. Um, yeah. So yeah, like I, I think it's quite important to have not necessarily like a full written record of every single node, but, but just to try and, and document what your game plan looks like. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's really cool. I, I, so I've, I've jumped around your course a little bit and I watched, uh, one video where you're going through an exercise of, of writing those things out. And, uh, I thought that was very useful and I, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that a little bit. I mean, I, I kind of do for general game plan, but yeah, I think it'd be useful for, for anybody, um, as an exercise, like any, any, honestly, any exercise where you're writing out some of your thoughts <laughs> tends to be yes. helpful. It helps um, a lot. We don't, we don't do yeah. that enough. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's surpri it's surprisingly effective. It is. Yeah. So, away from education, what's uh, what's next for you uh, with regards to poker playing? Um, well, I've been kind of working my way back into the live tournament scene, um, mm. which is great. Like just as just as fun as I remember it being. It's um, it's a very I guess I would say promising. Um, poker environment right now, especially in the U S uh, although from what I saw, it, I mean, EPT Barcelona, it seemed it was like breaking records and look great. I've, I've actually never been to an EPT. Um, Me neither. but, but yeah, basically just getting back to, to more live tournaments is as, as a player is my focus. Um, then I guess next couple of things on my radar would be the win championships in December. Um, yeah. and then the PCA in the Bahamas. Um, but that's, I guess, a couple months away. I've left a, a good bit of leeway for, you know, coaching and course related yeah. things. And, um, 
I also don't have a passport right now, which is a whole separate story. So I can, it's actually pretty complicated for me to travel. Um, okay. That's yeah. But that complicated. <laughs> yeah, the, the main thing is to, um, to spend my time preparing, like, you know, studying and, and coaching while I'm, while I'm here at home in Canada and then, uh, hitting the road to, to play some live tournaments. Yeah. Well, if you, as an anecdote, I, I went to a wedding, uh, I don't know how long ago, uh, a year ago or something, a year ago in London and, um, with some of our best friends and I found out like, <clears throat> I mean, a couple of weeks before that my passport had just expired. Um, <laughs> so I yep. ended up, yeah, I had to go, you, you couldn't do it here in Vegas. I had to go to LA to their something office, uh, an office. It was like a really long day. And I actually, I had to, there was some reason I had to be back like at a certain time, like I, I had to make it a really quick trip and I wasn't, mm -hmm. I ended up getting a, like a, uh, like a limo service to drive me both ways. And I slept <laughs> in the car because I found that to be the most efficient. It was, anyways, it was a very long day. Uh, yep. it was a very long day, but you got, so to, go if, to, the wedding. You got to go to the wedding. I did. I got to go to the wedding. Um, so if that's helpful, hopefully that helps you with your situation. <laughs> I actually could. It was so. I'll, I guess I'll I'll give you the yeah. the, the the previous uh, chapter of the story. So I was I was in Vegas for the World Series. Um, I had just become a Canadian citizen. So I like mid series. I flew to Canada took my oath, flew back to Vegas, which is not advisable apparently, because once you become a citizen, you're, you, you like physically cut up your travel documents, your Canadian PR card, okay. you, you physically destroy it. Um, and then apply for a passport after that. So oh. they're kind of, they kind of advise you like, Hey, by the way, don't travel for the next couple of months while you wait for your passport. And I was like, okay, see ya, I'm going to Vegas tomorrow. Um, yeah. Cause I have to get back to the world series. I already, okay. I already missed one big tournament. I, I had to skip a high roller to, to do that. Um, so yeah, one, once I got back, what I had to do was get like a, it's, it's like an official paper called confirmation of citizenship that like no one ever uses for any reason, really. Um, yeah. I had to get that FedEx to me in Vegas and go to a land border, um, present it to the officer at the land border and walk across from, from the U S to Canada. So it was like a, okay. a very roundabout way of returning home after the world series. Uh, I'd rather yeah. not have to go through that again. So I, ideally the passport arrives before I go to the, the win championships, but if not, I'll just fly to Buffalo and walk across the peace bridge again, I Thanks. guess. Okay. Good luck. Do you, you don't <laughs> still have a U.S. passport? I do. It, it's funny. I, I don't know what would go wrong if I used my U.S. passport, but my lawyer advised that I don't. I, oh, okay. I guess when traveling into Canada, like, you know, you, you tell them like, what, like, why are you visiting? They'll ask like, why are you visiting? And it's like, oh, I'm not visiting. I'm coming home or whatever. I don't know. It's some, something about the procedure. It's not, it's not correct. I think they would have to let me in, but I'd, I'd maybe get detained for like four hours. I'm, I'm not really sure yeah, how it works. One of those. I used to always get like at some point, cause I was going back and forth a lot. Um, <clears throat> at some point I got like flagged on the mm -hmm. list and basically every time I would come in, I'd go to the back room and then yeah. Ask yeah. me the same question. Yeah. It's a pain. You it's don't want to get flagged. <laughs> you don't want to get flagged. And I did. Um, all right, well, well let's, uh, let's end on a, on a low note, <laughs> uh, cross border <laughs> travel. Um, Thank you for, uh, for joining me. Uh, I, I mean, I, I love to nerd out about poker and poker education. Uh, so thank you. If, uh, if people want to find your course, it's at runonwants.com. If people want to find you, uh, where else can they look for you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter or Instagram. My handle in both places is at K Rapichow, first name, last initial. And, uh, I have a, a website for my private coaching as well. It's just my full name. So Kevin Cool. Yeah. And, uh, as I mentioned at the top, if you watch more Kevin Rabichow videos, uh, than any other coach and, uh, he's pretty good guys. Uh, <laughs> thanks, <Phil>. thanks Kevin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have a good one. <laughs> thanks. Appreciate it.